You know where you are? is Appetite for Distortion. Welcome to the podcast, Appetite for Distortion. My name is Brando, episode number 403. Welcome to the podcast, Mr. Steve Turner. How are you, sir? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm not as well as you, I think, because this is quite a feat to put together, uh, you know, your life story in, in a book. Uh, how long had you been working on this? It was it was sort of a pandemic project, if you will. Hmm. My co-author, Adam Tepetalin, contacted me to do it, and I wasn't touring. I wasn't working. So... I thought about it for a bit and decided to go go for it and uh we started doing you know zoom meetings and that sort of thing and uh wrestling it into shape right on a uh, mud ride a messy trip through the grunge explosion by uh by steve turner guitars and founding member of mud honey and of course you had the forward by stone gossard who uh from pearl jam who i've been lucky enough to have on the podcast uh nice. as well what was it because i just spoke to geezer butler and it's always interesting to ask somebody about when they they write their story was it something that you were looking forward to doing kind of getting it all out there out there or i don't know was it kind of like putting it uh to use a pun i guess to put another chapter or the last chapter the end of a a career even though you're still out there like how does it feel uh to sit down and whether it's a zoom meeting or to you know type yourself how did it feel to put your story together it was an interesting process. Uh, I mean, you know, I do a lot of interviews anyway. And uh, at this point, uh, since Mud Honey's been around for 35 years, there's a lot of looking back in most interviews that we do, which is fine. I'm, you know, I'm not a, I'm not overly nostalgic, I don't think, but uh, I, I like history. So I'm fine to deal with my history and the Seattle's history and stuff. And that was kind of one of my main focuses was i really wanted to get some of the earlier seattle uh music history and punk and where grunge came from kind of out there a little bit more than has been previously oh i love it oh and and by the way if you hear some crying in the background that's my my uh, six week year old uh, week week year old my six week son. Uh, I think he's uh, he wants to hear some more mud honey. He's uh, all right. Yeah, that's what, okay. that's what it's like hearing uh, having a studio at home. It is what yep. it is. So like whenever I try to sit down and do a Zoom meeting because there's a lot of distractions going on. Uh, like what kind of environment were you usually in when you were working on this book? Were you at home? Were you out on the road? Where were you? I was at home because it was the pandemic. The, the pandemic, um, right? Yeah, I, I live uh, with my two sons. They're 18 and 23. So if you hear one of them crying in the background, something's gone terribly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, I love it. <laughs> yeah, a lot of things happen. See, that when cause because of the pandemic, that's why I have a studio at home. And uh, it changed a lot of things for a, a lot of people. And I know that's uh, quite the, the understatement. But, yeah. But when I, I, I was excited to look to talk to you because I – you know, it's interesting. If you know the, the the name of this podcast, Appetite for Distortion, it's all, you know, uh, Guns N' Roses is the, the nucleus of it, but I talk all around it. But given my age, I'm going to be 40 in September. I really grew up with the, the grunge movement. That was my movement. And Mud Honey was always the name where everyone's like, oh, it's Nirvana, Nirvana, Nirvana. People are like, no, Mud Honey first. That's something I always grew up with. So uh-huh. I appreciate and to, to learn more from your perspective because it's, it wasn't all about Nirvana. Uh, is that something that you, like, how do you look at that? I mean, you, just the way you write, you seem to understand and grasp it all. Uh, was there any sort of, I don't want to say jealousy, that's too negative, but was it just like, hey, we're here too. You know, we're, we're not getting the, uh, I don't know, we're, we're, our names aren't in, in lights as much as like a, a Pearl Jam or a Soundgarden. You guys were at the forefront. You're the forefathers of, of grunge. Well, there was never any jealousy or anything like that from 
our point of view, I can collectively say that with Mudhoney. Um, you know, what our standard answer was always when people ask if, you know, we were bummed out that we didn't get that kind of success. We always just say, have you heard our records? You know, it's, it's not mainstream radio friendly stuff necessarily. I know like in the early 90s, all bets were off and that the major labels were signing anything that looks sloppy with long hair. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, we were ecstatic at the level of success that we had <laughs> and that continue to have like we sure we still you know pinch ourselves so uh uh you know we're doing just fine and you know it, before nirvana hit big i would always joke like man in a perfect world nirvana would be number one then nirvana hit number one and it still wasn't a perfect world but at least nirvana hit number one hmm. what is it about seattle like as a new yorker you know obviously i was behind you know, a different world back then. You know, it wasn't like yeah. the internet and any, and everything going on. Uh, but what is it about Seattle that they just seem to have this hub of just great musicians and great talent and great bands that came out of that? Was it was there something in the water? What was it about Seattle? I think a lot of it had to do with the uh, geographic isolation. Hmm. Uh, we were left to our own devices for a long time, basically the 80s. Uh, it, we didn't always have a, a club that bands could come and play at. Uh, you know, underground shows happened, but not all the time. There was, you know, real dry spells where there was, you know, you, maybe you'd go see one of your friend's band play in a basement or something. So we had a lot of years to percolate ideas and switch members around and change band names and without any kind of uh, anybody paying attention. And so a really healthy scene started to develop in the mid 80s. And by 1988, we were lucky enough to have Sub Pop Records really get behind the local scene and start uh, releasing records and getting the hype going. Uh, and then the gigantic explosion of 91, of course, but that's that was a whole other story, kind of. Yeah, a lot of it, which you uh, you detail in, in your book. But what I found interesting, because you're originally from Texas, Yep. Do you take any of that? Because I mean, you moved when you were two. However, I, I was born in Brooklyn. I like to say I'm a Brooklyn Jew, even though I was one and a half when I moved from Brooklyn to Long Island. Like, do you oh, no. do, you, do you feel like a Texan at heart still, or are you a Seattle through and through? Well, my girlfriend gets really tired of me reminding her that I'm from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, all my clan was from Texas. We were the first to leave Texas. And so I spent a lot of summers down in Texas, like not every summer, but almost every summer I'd go down there for like a month and visit all my great aunts and uh, uncles and uh, grandmother. And, you know, uh, so I spent a lot of time in Texas and I, I have a real soft spot for Texas still. Uh, my passport says I'm from Texas, so dang it. I'm a Texan. Ah, <laughs> there you go. Because I was curious, like, I don't know if you went back and forth, how much you went back and forth in your younger days. Was it a, a culture shock at all to go from Texas to Seattle and back and forth? Uh, was it just Seattle where the flannel was growing? Or was it in Texas as well? Like, where did you kind of see that that scene sprout up, even though the, the genesis was in, in Seattle, it seemed? Yeah, I think... You know, we all, like I said, we all came out of the punk rock and hardcore scenes as far as the musicians go. And Texas had a great punk scene in the early 80s. So I was just really upset that I didn't have any family members that lived in Austin. Mm. It was it was like, seemed like the only town in Texas I didn't have relatives. And I was like, come on, man, that's the only place I want to go. That's where all the <laughs> were. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was bummed by that. But, um, yeah, I, I, you know, there's a lot of Texas. Uh, I discovered Lightning Hopkins really early on in my life, and I was excited that he was born in the Houston area, as was I. And uh, so that was exciting for me. Uh, Towns Van Zant I discovered pretty early on as well, and uh, another Houston area Texan that I definitely felt a kinship with. Um, so yeah, 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 but that's unrelated to really what was going on in Seattle, I suppose. That was just me discovering music. Sure. Uh, and the Seattle thing was, I think it was just the small scene that all these bands and people, we'd go see each other once. Basically, once we had a good club, the Metropolis, that opened in 1983, 
and it was open for maybe a year, year and a half. Um, that really coalesced things to me. Um, and we all got to play like bands from out of town, finally had a place that they could play. And so the scene really started to explode there for me, kind of the post hardcore world. Who did you, because you mentioned, you know, just in, in, in Texas and discovering music, uh, who were you discovering? Who were the first bands that kind of helped you on your, your path to success with Mud Honey? Uh, the very first concert I went to was Devo nice. on the Freedom of Choice tour. And that was because they used uh, skateboarders in their videos and stuff. And so all of us skaters had to go see Devo. Hmm. Uh, a few days later, I saw Black Flag. Nice. That was huge. Um, a local band called Soldier, of uh, young teenage punk rockers, opened that show. And that was mind-blowing for me to see kids my age on stage. Uh, so that was huge. Uh, uh, then, you know, I discovered all the regular, bigger punk bands. The Clash was a huge favorite of mine, Stiff Little Fingers. Uh, started getting into the American underground hardcore stuff, the Adolescents, Minor Threat, JFA, the big boys out of Texas. Uh, there was just so much TSOL, um, you know, all that stuff kind of played into it. Some of the English experimental post-punk like public image was a huge influence, I would say on Seattle. Okay. Uh, they, they played Seattle in 1982 and it was one of the best concerts I think any of us had ever seen. Um, <laughs> I got into like some of the really dumb punk rock stuff, like anti nowhere league, <laughs> things like that, you know, the misfits, uh, you know, all that stuff you know, played into it. Okay. Um, a big turning point for me was 1984 era when Meat Puppets 2 came out. That was a huge record for me. And it pointed towards uh, Neil Young because every review of it kept comparing it to Neil Young's Zuma, I think. So I went out and bought Zuma yeah. and uh, became a lifelong Neil Young fan and, you know, that kind of stuff. Obviously, the Stooges were huge for me and Mark. Okay, right on. And, and, and I guess like speaking, this is the transition, speaking of the Stooges, and I mentioned before, Appetite for Distortion, it's a Guns N' Roses theme. You know, currently Duff McKagan, he, uh, he's like him and Iggy Pop need to have like a, a buddy cop show. Like, just they're best friends. He's, he's, they're covering the Stooges live now with, uh, with TVI. Uh, and Duff, obviously, from Seattle, and you wrote yeah. about him a lot in, in your book. And what I he find... He was everywhere. He was in every band in Seattle, it seemed like. <laughs> right, so I guess that's kind of where my question is leading to because he was in all these different bands, 10 Minute Warning, The Farts. Uh, was that what it was like in Seattle where the, I use the word uh, incestuous, was it, were you just trying to find the right band that would stick or you just wanted to keep playing with as many people as you, would let you play? I think it was trying to find the right combination of people, right? I, you know, Duff is an exception because he can play any instrument. And, you know, he was he was the drummer, he was the bass player, he was a guitar player, whatever was needed, he, he could do it. I was not that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I could barely play guitar. <laughs> so I was kind of, my, my point of view was, you know, Mark, once Mark and I discovered that we had a real kinship musically and liked to hang out, it, we, we kind of became partners, if you will. And almost everything that I've done through the years has been with Mark. Hmm. Uh, to keep it with with Duff, I guess I'm curious to, you know, like the first time you met him, what he was like. What was young Duff McKagan like? He can do a lot, but was he? Because it's interesting to see, you know, to know where he came from and the addictions, the struggles, and you look at him now. He is just like he is a role model through and through. Mm-hmm. What was yeah, he like yeah. back then? Was he like that? Was he? Did he have that in him? You know, he was really, he, he was my age, I think. Uh, he might have even been a year younger than me, for all I know. Um, I'm 58 right now. Uh, but, I, you know, he was around my age, but he was more, like, I was a suburban skate rat. And he was a cool Seattle punk, you know, leather jacket dude. Um, I was not that guy. Uh but he's, he always was very nice, and he was in some of the best bands in Seattle. Uh, I didn't know him well. I, I won't pretend that I knew him well, you know, at all. But, uh, you know, 10-Minute Warning, that was that was a great band for a little while. 
you you mentioned that you saw him with uh, his new band at the time, uh, Guns N' Roses. Yeah. And at the time, which I completely understand, you know, at the when at the beginning they were kind of a a clusterfuck on stage and just like uh-huh. you, uh, so you didn't foresee them becoming who they would be. Can you, what do you remember though from the show that you did see uh, early Guns N' Roses? Well, that was you know. Some people say that was the first Guns N' Roses show, but I think they'd already played a party or two in L.A. But they came up at the invitation of the Fastbacks because he had been in the Fastbacks. And uh, they opened for the Fastbacks. And my memory of it is it was mainly covers. Hmm. Like, I don't think I don't think really this is like 1986, right? Yeah, Um, it's it's well documented. This show It was at the Gorilla Gardens, the Rock Theater. and I just remember thinking, like, man, Duff left Seattle for this because, you know, we thought Ten Minute Warning was the coolest band in town. Well, the Human and Ten Minute Warning, I guess, were the two coolest bands in town in 1985, 86. But, uh, you know, I was kind of like, wow, that's not that's not great. <laughs> <laughs> but by the time their debut record came out, they were great. Hmm. So, you know, they they were getting their stuff together. That's cool. Uh, it's cool to see, you know, to go back and look about, you know, with hindsight being twenty twenty. I guess with that, uh, you, you saw, I guess you could see Nirvana break through and kind of pave a way for the rest of that scene to finally be noticed. Did you foresee Nirvana's success? Um, well, you know, Mudhoney, we kind of got there first. We had some pretty good underground buzz and success in 88 and 89 and 90 you know we were we were doing all right right uh nirvana had their debut album out that had that one song about a girl on it right Mm -hmm. and it's a fantastic pop song and i could see them becoming huge in a just and perfect world but I didn't see them becoming huge because the world is not just and perfect. <laughs> mm. But so it was it was surprising to me when Nevermind exploded like that. But I think they were the right band at the right time. They that video uh, for Smells Like Teen Spirit was a great video and very evocative, and I think showed the sheltered masses a whole nother world. It was kind of dangerous and raw, whereas the hair metal bands that were real popular at the time were not raw and it kind of took everybody by surprise the industry and all the other bands that suddenly had to start wearing uh, long johns underneath their cut off shorts <laughs> <laughs> in, in the book and I want people to read it you do talk about you know where you were and how you found out um, about Kurt's death but uh, you know and I appreciate you sharing that story again you know again given my age I remember that I remember being in, in, in class you know in elementary school when the word got out and again the days before cell phones and the internet and it's just a uh, crazy how we still you know talk about his legacy today but another person I, I don't know how well I guess a couple other people I'm not sure how well you knew them uh, I don't know. We uh, we only have a couple more minutes. Um, Chris Cornell and Lane Staley. Mm-hmm. Uh, how well did you know them? I knew Kurt better than than Chris or Lane. Um, you know, we did a lot of shows with Nirvana, and uh, he was a, Kurt was a very shy person and obviously very troubled. Um, the last time I saw him, he was walking down the street from the direction where he lived like he had escaped is what it seemed like because i knew he they had had him in rehabs and he was kept leaving and stuff and he did not look well at all and uh you know that was sad uh you know i heard about his death when i was in washington dc on tour with uh pearl jam but honey was opening for pearl jam on a leg of their tour at the time so that was kind of surreal and it was it was numbing at the time honestly i don't think I dealt with it for a long time after it. But, uh, you know, Lane's thing was such a slow, sad decline that all the rumors were awful about him. And Chris's was just out of nowhere. That that was the shocking one. Yeah. Uh, that, that was just like, wait, what happened? Um, and that's, you know, terribly tragic. And, you know, it seemed like it, it, that one seemed really un, 
necessary at that stage in his life and everything. So that, that was just like inexplicable to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know it's a heavy thing to, to, to say, but just, you know, to be transparent, just a few years prior, I lost my dad the same way. You know, so in, in, in around the same age, so it is a, uh, it is crazy. But every uh, you know anniversary, it just gives me a chance to to speak up because and in, in, uh, everyone is. I think mental health is just viewed so differently now, and you wonder what these people's lives would have been like if they would have survived if we had the mental health treatment that we uh, we do now. Uh, one last thing before I wrap up because it's a fan question they just came in uh, on Twitter this is from uh, Mark uh, he just wants to know how he, uh, he wonders how you stayed so grounded as a band with you doing bits at Sub Pop etc and he wants you to know how loved they are uh, around the world <laughs> I, I think we're you, you know we're we're not young men at this point in our lives right I'm 58 uh, I think we're fairly sensible and when it stopped being our full-time job over 20 years ago now we kind of had to figure out how important it was to us and how to fit it into our lives you know i've got two grown kids that live with me here and uh you know guy and dan both have kids and managing that and careers on the outside and trying to figure out how to make it work we figured out how to make it work <laughs> it, it takes an awful lot of emails to figure out how to make it work <laughs> <laughs> i understand what that's like uh well, steve this was a pleasure thank you so much uh, i hope we get to do this again yeah thank you fun interview with steve turner and truth be told i recorded that the same day as i did the geezer butler interview but i wanted to wait to put it out and then all this Guns N' Roses news kept happening, the tours, and I was away in Chicago for weeks watching my sister-in-law get married. We drove the entire way with a two-month-old, which <laughs> it, it worked out. All things considered, it kind of worked out. And the show, another reason why I married my wife is that because we drive through Indiana to get to Chicago. And, all, of course, I have to say, hey, you know Axel's from... Indiana, Lafayette, or Lafayette, however you, you pronounce it, because I've heard both, so perhaps somebody from the the town can actually correct me, and if it wasn't too much out of the way, we would have went. My wife probably would, if I said, yeah, let's go, she would have went, but again, when you have a two-month-old, you kind of just want to get to your destination as quick as possible, especially when <laughs> the drive itself is 12 hours from uh, from Queens, New York to, to Chicago. But we did it, and I'm back. Perhaps you can hear all the noise here outside my uh, studio apartment here in, in Queens. But I'm just curious if this goes through your mind as much as it does mine when I'm interviewing somebody about their book now. So Steve Turner, Vicki Hamilton... He's a butler. I feel like there's an elephant in the room. Or I kind of have to almost repress some of my feelings. As I was writing a book, Doug Goldstein's book, for nearly two years. And I've been somewhat vague about it. Because, I don't know, I feel like I, I want to leave the door open for an apology. Honestly, an apology. If I, I, I don't remember how specific I've been, but I'll just be really clear cut is that he wanted to go to a specific literary agency not anything special about the literary agency you know it's a famous one it's a reputable one a good one but because the head of that agency is friends with this big time entertainment lawyer that Doug was set on working with and there was seemed to be no steering for, away from that direction and it was pretty clear at the beginning that this guy did not, this literary agent did not want to work with me. He wanted an actual author, whatever that means. I mean, you know what it means, but at the same time, I'm not an idiot. I have a degree in broadcast journalism. You know, I, I've, I'm a professional broadcaster for, for 20 years. You know, I, I know how to write. So when I read parts of Steve Turner's book. I don't have time to read an entire book, but I read parts of his book, Geezer's book, Vicki Hamilton's book. It's like, I was doing the same exact fucking thing. But no, mine wasn't good enough for this guy that really gave me, pretended to give me leeway or pretended to 
to want to be there and, and make me the guy. No, he he had an agenda, and Doug didn't want to see it uh, at the beginning, and I just didn't want to cause anything. Like, Doug, this is your book. Let's work this out. Like, I don't want to yell at this guy, you know, being like, what, what the hell? Like, we should go somewhere else. And Doug gave me some... His his big uh, solution was writing two books, one with me and one with uh, another guy, which is just a really really dumb idea. I, I I told him that I'm like, think about it. Yeah, there are very famous artists that have several books written about them, but none of them were just a manager, and they don't come out at the same time. So it just all felt like a slap in the face. So I'm going to continue to do what I, I did on the Vicki Hamilton episode is read excerpts from the book when it's prudent. You know, I'm, I'm not going to post the entire book online because it's just not done. And I don't want to be judged on that. I think it's pretty good for a very unfinished product, but it's, it's far from finished. And I wouldn't want to be judged on that. So what I'm going to do is just randomly post stories or, or share them here on the podcast. And... This came out because, and we'll do a shotgun news in the upcoming episodes, and we're going to do a uh, Glastonbury slash Glasgow uh, review coming up, and we'll talk about it there. But there was a picture of Axel and Slash in studio together in Norway with a couple of the engineers in this very famous in this studio in, in Norway. Of course, the picture goes viral, and I took it upon myself still wearing my journalism hat to inquire for an interview uh sent an instagram message if it that's how it is it's not always email and i want to read you what this guy said and i I posted it on social media and i really appreciate the responses that i got in support uh, of me and this is no fault to the urban sound studios so this is what i wrote and i'm going to tell you my approach to interviews uh, hey there, my name is Brendan Weisler, and I work for iHeartRadio in New York. I also have a podcast called Appetite for Distortion. I'm sure you're sworn to secrecy, but I was wondering if there was somebody who I could interview about the experience of hacks- having Axel and Slash in your studio. Also talk about the history of your studio. Succinct, quick, get to the point. Guy writes back, hey Brandon, as one of the few serious messages, I appreciate your request. I have listened to a few of your podcasts on your channel. I would be happy to do an interview whenever is good for you. And then they sent me their email for faster communication. I say, thank you. You know, I can only imagine the fan inundation of fan requests, uh, fan questions that that they're getting. And after that, uh, the next day, hi again. I think it's not possible to do any interview. There isn't much we can discuss about the session. Okay, I understand. I appreciate the response. That's it. So he was wanting to do it and then couldn't do it. Sound familiar? Sound like something that's I've been battling throughout these seven years of doing this podcast? A bummer, I guess. You know, I, I we just wanted to talk about the experience. Obviously, if it was okay, if this guy was like, oh, they were working on mixes of, you know, brand new stuff. They were working on mixes of live stuff. If he was able to give me an answer, great. But I knew going in, based upon my experience with this band, that was not going to happen. So that's why I went in with the soft landing, and then it didn't happen. And then I see a lot of people blaming Axel or Team Brazil for this happening. Look, I'm sure management had something to do with it, if not all of everything to do with it. Uh, I've spoken about this ad nauseum, how... I had two different, very reliable sources tell me who don't know each other. Brain and the uh, and the CEO of Golden Robot Records don't know each other. Both tell me that because Frank Ferrer has been on my my podcast. Uh, Brain wanted uh, wanted to get Melissa on my podcast, so they both were told that all the non famous members of GNR, you know, everybody other than Axel Slash and Duff, were told not to do any interviews unless approved by Fernando and I was specifically mentioned and this was a couple years ago and I didn't even talk about it when it first happened because for one it really hurt my feelings and I thought maybe I just I need to prove myself more and just more opportunities kept being pulled away from me and it's like what am I doing 
I I'm doing this podcast for for myself because it's fun. It started out as a, a a kind of way of getting out of my depression, to be honest with you. And this is for you. I, I wouldn't be doing this for this long if it wasn't for you. So you deserve answers. Like, oh, why can't you get this person back on or, or something? Because I'm still dealing with, oh, I, I can't interview Josh Todd because I have a Guns N' Roses podcast. I've interviewed him twice. And recently this happened where the label reached out to me asking if I want to in, uh, interview Josh Todd. Sure, absolutely. He was, he was a great guy. And then their management said no. I've interviewed him twice, assholes. Like, what do you think I'm going to do? Because I have a Guns N' Roses podcast. Same thing with why I was denied an interview with Extreme. I have a Guns N' Roses podcast. I don't think these people know what it means. The situation with uh, Adrian Smith, Myron Maiden, that I was asked to take out an entire you know minute clip of that was all it was. Adrian talking about that 1988 tour with uh, with GNR and and Maiden that didn't go so well, and he gave a very diplomatic answer, which was harmless. But Iron Maiden's management told me to get to take it out. I waited a year and then they put it out because it's all just stupid and short sighted and. So I'm I'm mentioning this because it's not just Guns N' Roses management. It's not just Team Brazil that is perhaps overprotective. Perhaps they need to be that overprotective because there are a lot of beggars and hangers on, as uh, Snake put once said. So there's a degree in which I get it. But at the same time, there's communication between people. That you don't need to assume, okay, this is just a guy that's going to talk about Guns N' Roses for an hour. Or if he interviews Melissa, he's going to inundate him, inundate her with just questions about new music. I know how to handle these interviews to make everybody happy. That's why I'll get people on to talk about what they're promoting. Not just about Guns N' Roses, just like today with, with Steve Turner. You know, it's... You've been listening for over 400 episodes. You know it. I'm preaching to the choir. So I'm just, I've been tried to build a reputation. And I think I've done a decent job of it. So I, I got a lot of, uh, you know, anti-Team Brazil uh, comments and, and beta. And I want this, this is one of the things that I really wanted out there from the book. And I'm going to read it to you now. Why? But one, I've never met Beta or Fernando. I've never spoken to them. So it's hard for me to really say anything bad when I don't know these people. And for, for all intents and purposes, they don't know me either. They're just going by, oh, I, this person gets picked up by Blabbermouth and uh, Ultimate Guitar and Alternative Nation, all these clickbait, you know, clickbaity websites maybe. Or uh, It's not me. I don't set people up for these questions. But <laughs> uh, I don't think I even mentioned this. This is like what happened with um, Kip Winger. He gets mad that the Metallica thing became a story. It's like, I didn't ask you to go up and in on Lars. I asked you something that you could have answered in, in 20 seconds and gave a generic response to. You know, a question you've been asked over and over again about the dart throwing. But he gets mad at me. Email me. Calls me. <sighs> Kip Winger calls me complaining. I, aren't you like a professional? Haven't you been doing interviews for years? Don't you know how this works? I didn't set you up. So it's, I still have to fight. I really still have to fight to, to do all, to get these episodes out to you. But here I want to paint Beta in a positive light because this is a story that I know. And I posted it on Twitter and I got some interesting reaction to it because I thought it was going to be overwhelmingly in support of. But I think some people just... Again, I don't know how you can judge somebody completely without knowing them. So this is the story from Doug. So as I'm sure you know, Beta was the housekeeper, nanny for Stephanie Seymour, supermodel Stephanie Seymour, when uh, Axel and her were engaged. And after that, people don't, I don't think, really know this story about how she left Stephanie to work with Axel. And now that's Team Brazil that runs Guns N' Roses all these years later. How did this happen? How did she get so close to Axel? Well, uh, because Axel feels like it's a mother figure. So this is kind of 
what happened. Again, this is according to Doug Goldstein's never-to-be-published book. And I put out a tweet that Stephanie Seymour was engaged to six other guys. And Beta had to tell Axel about it because, I mean, that's fucked up, right? So this is the, the actual story as I wrote through. Doug tells me the story. I wrote it. You, you get it. So every single time Axel and Stephanie got together, Beta was there. I think I'm, I, I, I'm not pronouncing it right, by the way. So forgive me with my poor New York accent. Beta. Uh, she saw how much Axel loved Stephanie and Dylan. Dylan was her young son. And Axel really, really wanted to be his stepfather. But Beta has a secret. Stephanie is engaged to six other men at the same time. Beta can't do it anymore. You can't keep that a secret. She knows if she divulges, she's fired. But she grew to love Axel so much, she didn't care. Beta didn't say to Axel, by the way, can you hire me if I'm fired? Never. That was never predicated upon that. That's why I find it difficult to say much negative about Beta. That's what Doug said. We'll talk about Team Brazil and what my opinion is because it has nothing to do with them personally. And in his book, he just criticizes them as far as management, but not as people. Maybe I'll read you that excerpt another time. When Beta finally showed Axel the seven engagement rings, including the one that he gave to Stephanie, she was sobbing as she told him everything. If Stephanie was going to Peter Brandt or whoever she was engaged to, Beta's responsibility was to hand her the correct ring to put on. On a plane, if you're going to see this guy, put that on. Go to see Axel, put that on. She had to take care of the ring situation. Axel, clearly, he's hurt. That pretty much ended the relationship right there. Axel said to, to Beta, You and I both know what's going to happen now. She's going to fire you for divulging this. But you have a job with me. I want you to move in. Take care of my daily stuff. And she could take care of everything. Except for when Axel was despondent. She didn't know what to do about that. So this is some stuff that I don't want to go into. Because it's not my place to say. Even in Doug's book. Because it would have been. Um, Doug and I would have had to build the. I mean because he's spoken about some of it. So it's not so much of a secret. But Axel's depression. We go into a deep dive into Axel's depression. And how we could have lost him. A few times we could have lost him. So Betta used to go to Doug, say, help me with this situation. With, with Let's talk Axel off the proverbial ledge uh, kind of thing. So Betta, I mean, she, I don't know. Like, what would have happened? It, it would have been crazy if Axel just found this out, given how angry he was at that time. But Betta came and became the family. And that's how... Fernando growing up with Axel, and that's just kind of how the story began. So I see that, and I'm like, okay, they have a deep trust in history there. That's why. But there are, I saw comments thinking, or, or saying that Beto had a, an agenda. She knew what she was doing. I, I don't agree with that based upon Doug's story. So I say all due respect. You know, I, I, I again, I hope to earn certain interviews with Melissa uh, to earn trust with Duff and Slash because they, they give interviews. This is not even about Axel. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I might as well be asking for an interview with, uh, with Jesus Christ. Like I get it. But I want to be able to earn. And I divulge these things after a certain period of time and conversation with people. You know, I'm not just on here spilling everything. Then you can't trust somebody. But I've tried to have off-air conversations with Doug, and I just don't feel good. You know, somebody who was just really sweet and nice to me throughout the period of our friendship, it just ended, I don't know. But the, I, He just kind of petered out, didn't really say much to me, and I just felt very disrespected and, and not cared about. So... Um, obviously my priorities have kind of changed with, I got my kid here. I don't got time for this shit. I, I don't, I love doing this podcast and this book was going to be a big part of it. It really was. And, and Doug, 
bless him for this. At, in, at the beginning, he's like, maybe this is the start of a new career for you where you can help people write their books. And oh my God, you know, it was never about money. Never, ever about money. It was just about the this experience. And yeah, in the end, if it got published, money. That was Doug's thing. Never apologized for not having the book come out or, or kind of bailing on me for after almost two years. But he calls me one day. This is when I went to go see Jane's Addiction and Smashing Pumpkins at Madison Square Garden. And I had been trying to reach him for weeks. That's And that happened throughout the duration of the book. Like we'd have a good period of like we're getting together a couple times a week. And then I wouldn't hear from him for like a month. It's hard to write a book that way. But we were doing it. We were doing it under no timeline until the uh, literary agent kept giving me timelines. That's because he's after money. That's all he cares about, the money. He doesn't care about the product. I don't think Doug saw that. So he's like, uh, don't worry, I'm not going to leave you high and dry, you know, regardless of what happens with the book. So apparently, apparently at that time, he didn't, he didn't even uh, decide what he wanted to do. I'm like, all right, fine. You know, if he gives me some cash, uh, fine. Then that'll make the uh, less than the blow, I guess. Nothing. Nothing's happened. He left me a voicemail one time apologizing that he just has no money. Then how do you live, bro? I'm not... <laughs> I didn't even give him a price. Like, something to show good faith. Nothing. So if he hears this... Oh, then he started tagging me. I'm telling you everything. He starts tagging me on Facebook and all these uh, Bible quotes. I had to block him. Come on, man. Like We haven't finished our conversation. There's no closure here. And you're tagging me in Bible stuff? Like, ugh. That's when I was like, I just tapped out. I'm like, I don't even need to deal with this anymore. It just kind of was like a, almost like an ex-girlfriend that wants to be friends. And you just don't, you're like, why? There's not, I'm getting nothing out of this relationship anymore. Which sucks because he was a great guest and he would bring on great guests. But again, I am I can only swallow so much pride. So I wanted to give you that beta story in full. Never before heard. Would have been one of the biggest stories in Doug's Never to be seen book. There you have it. Okay? So <laughs> I had to get that off my chest. I've been waiting. Uh, I tried to do an episode or record this part in Chicago, but too many things going on. But back in New York, I'm going to get more episodes, crank them out. I still have the Stephen Piercy uh, episode taped and, and ready to go. And I'm going to do more fan reviews. I've been getting requests. So if you're going to upcoming shows... You've been hitting me up a variety of ways. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Send me an email the AFD show at gmail.com. However you want to do it, just let me know. And we'll have fun talking about Guns N' Roses this summer. And all these set list changes and perhaps a new single coming out. It's a lot of fun stuff to talk about. So let's, uh, let's have fun, shall we? So that does it for this episode of Appetite for Distortion. When will you see the next one? Well, in the words of Axel Rose concerning Chinese democracy, I don't know as soon as the word, but you'll see it.